Crazy rain the other day, huh? <laughs> Little intense. Ditches filled right up, but the farmers needed it, right? It's good stuff. It's been a good summer for everybody. Coming to the end, goodness gracious, August goes by quick, eh? August is a blink, man. Happens fast. But uh, I'm just going to pray, and then we'll get into it. I'm just listening to myself. Yeah. There's a joke there. I can't. It's too early to think. <laughs> Jesus, thank you for this morning. Uh, thank you for um, what you're doing in our hearts, Lord. Thank you for your, your spirit and how this is beyond um, just logic and reason and figuring and understanding, Lord. We thank you that you are a God who is the master of hearts and you know how to persuade and to interact and guide and Lord, we thank you for your grace this morning um, to shore up and enable us to, to grasp what it is the Spirit of God is saying this morning. And uh, we just submit to your goodness and what it is you want to say to us this morning. Amen. Yeah, uh, so episode five. Um, we are introduced to John the Baptist, who's a little sharp, eh? Funny how they portrayed him. I, I know guys like that. I'm a little like that. But <laughs> just a little bit. Probably more before a few years ago. But uh, you think about a guy who grows up in the woods eating bugs. A little crazy. The religious systems rejected him. When he encounters a Pharisee, it's, it's probably going to be like that. It's probably not going to be a nice, hey, how's it going, handshake, high five, cool. It's going to be nasty. There's going to be back and forth. Um, John's going to view them as religious zealots who know nothing about the nature of God. Uh, he's the prophet in the wilderness, right? Eating bugs. He's committed. Um, and so it, it's funny when um, Nicodemus goes searching. That's the first interaction, right? We see this hit this between the, the prophet in the wilderness and the religious system. And they both make assumptions about each other, um, which I noticed immediately. And again, as we're going through this, right, guys, this isn't scripture. There's creative liberties that have been taken. Um, but because of a little thing called logos, it's like divine order and nature. You know, you can see the gospel in a flower, okay? Um, the, the fact that we get to create stuff like this as, as humans and, and be creative and, and put our own spin on it, it doesn't mean it, it's not... Um, we can't grasp stuff from it, right? God speaks through it. it obviously, doesn't carry the authority of Scripture, um, but it's good. And I can't watch this stuff without getting choked up at least a few times. So that, that means a lot to me. So we see this. Um, we see John, he's interacting. And I can relate to that, man, because I don't know if you guys, if you have family members or if you have friends or people you just run into, questions are big, especially if they find out you actually believe in Jesus. Um, questions can come really, really straight and really sharp sometimes. And, or if you, even amongst Christians, right, if you believe certain things about God and other people don't believe those things about God, there can be this immediate confrontation, right? And I have definitely been guilty of pulling a John the Baptist there and <laughs> being a little sharp because I'm assuming the motives. I'm like, okay, this person's just come in to give me a spanking for what they think I believe is wrong. Well, okay, let's hear it. Yeah, what's, what's next? Come on. But we see, and it's awesome because they portray it, we see that John's tune actually changes when Nicodemus, he starts seeing his heart behind, the motivation behind the questions, right? John thinks he's this religious Pharisee who came from the Jerusalem to question this dirty little guy who lives in the bush. And he's like, been there, done that, bring it. What do you got? But then he starts seeing, oh, Nicodemus is, like, no one knows he's here. He's seeking this stuff out on his own. And John changes his tune, right? And so what I kind of grab from that is uh, we have to, and you see this in the life of Jesus everywhere, right? Jesus deals with people based on the questions they ask and the heart motivation behind it. There's a few times where it says Jesus could see what they, like, their, their heart behind the question. And whenever they asked a question with a bad heart, Jesus always asked a question in return. So he, he switched his strategy. And then when Nicodemus would ask a question to Jesus, right, even in the scriptures, Jesus would answer him differently than he would answer the other Pharisees. And so for me, I just kind of grabbed like, yeah, you know what, like, um, 
we can become so caught up in what we think is right and what we believe and how we interpret things. And there is really a place to be soft, especially when we're dealing with other people, not jump to conclusions, not prejudge the situation, but really ask God for guidance and how to, how to interact with people's hearts. Because I've definitely pulled the John. And it's funny because it's like bad and then it gets good and then it gets bad at the end. And it's interesting how... Um, I love the back and forth between John and Nicodemus because he says this stuff about, you know, these demons came out of this woman and John's like, bingo, I know what this means. Oh my goodness, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. He starts freaking out, right? And then he starts asking questions. He's like, hey, finish the verse, Nicodemus. Who is this? Who does this sound like? And because of Nicodemus' understanding of scripture and because of how he interprets things and because of his position, he's hard. He's like, you're treating the Torah horribly, <laughs> right? Right? He's like, you're hermeneutic, right, Steph? Your hermeneutic is bad. That's like academic Bible school language. I guarantee that uh, that's probably more where Nicodemus was coming from. Not that it was wrong, but we see that Nicodemus was flip-flopping, right? We see Nicodemus' heart, and he's like getting pulled in, and, and him and John are having this interaction. And then when John crosses a crosses a line with Nicodemus, Nicodemus shuts down and gets hard again. And he won't even hear about this Messiah, this son of God. He won't even hear about it. That's not how it works. There's no son. Israel is his only son. He's like, okay, if that's the way you want it. Right? John's not worried about it. He's, he's already in jail. I guess he's got nothing else to worry about. But Nicodemus, and this is something that I, I have, I've had a couple really big breakthrough moments in the last five years um, and they were hard fought, but Nicodemus could only go so far in his thinking before he was offended, okay? And what I mean by that is there's this little verse that says, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble, right? And so when Nicodemus got cut off in his thinking, when he couldn't go any further with his heart is when he was offended. So the point at which Nicodemus would go no further is when this guy is not respecting my position as a Pharisee, or this guy is not treating the Torah well, or this guy is not doing something that I agree with. That was his line. And we see directly when that line was crossed, because of the way he thought, he was offended and he hardened himself. And he literally couldn't receive revelation because he was offended. Painful, eh? A lot of the times, I, I, I mean, I would, I came out of SBS, like, I knew all the, I knew it all, right? I, I, <laughs> obviously, I didn't think that, but I knew a lot, and I was still really unsatisfied. And my heart was, felt still far from him. Even though I, I could counsel myself with all the right verses, right? And, I actually had to allow, I had, I had to recognize that there was this position where I did not know it all, in a heart level. I did not understand. Uh, even, and even if it was, this gospel goes way deeper than your logic, than how you interpret, than how you understand things, and all that sort of stuff. And so, Oftentimes, I think we hit walls where, man, I'm not, gain, I'm not growing. I'm not gaining any more revelation. I'm not seeing anything clearer. I've been in this confused, unfocused spot for a long time. <laughs> Talking about Nicodemus, right? When, what prevented the revelation of what John was trying to portray to him? John was filled with the Spirit, okay? Or it was upon him, at least, as a prophet. He's giving revelation and Nicodemus couldn't receive it, even though John was feeding him. He's like feeding him. Come on, come on, puppy. He's like, rah, no. Gets cut off. It was a fence. And so if, if I'm ever in a spot, man, where I'm feeling like I can't receive, or um, and that's probably a good way to put it. God is a good giver. He's a giver of gifts. For God so loved the world that he gave. It's what he does. But sometimes we are bad receivers. <laughs> and we can get mad at God, but it's like, it's like taking a square peg and trying to put it into a round hole. You can't do it. 
The round hole needs to change into a square shape, right? And that happens through humility. And I'm not saying you can't be confident in what you know. I'm just saying we got to be moldable. We have to, like, go, Jesus wrecked a lot of my understanding of what I thought. He's, and he's continually doing that. I'm pretty used to it now. I'm not going to say I've aced it. But when I come to this thing and it's like, actually, Daniel, you know what? You might want to walk this direction a little more. It's like, all right. Because a few years ago, I got whopped. I thought I understood and I didn't. And he completely transformed me with grace. But... Um, there was some humility that needed to be there first. Amen? So thanks to Nicodemus and John's interaction, let's all learn to be a little more humble in our understanding. Um, let's see here. I've got to stop saying um. I don't want you guys to do this, but I, when I was in debate class in high school, we would sit in class, and if somebody had a, a twitch, like some people play with their ring incessantly when they're talking, or some people like tap their toe, or some people, like they say, um, um. And so everyone was watching this person, and whenever somebody would do a tick, everybody in the audience was supposed to start doing it so that they would see, oh, that's what I'm doing. And so there'd be a guy up there playing with his ring, and everybody would start going like this, and you'd be, oh, uh, uh, uh. And so it just threw you off pretty bad. Or everyone would say, um, like, um, please don't do that to me. <laughs> um... In-laws, am I right? I'm just kidding. <laughs> One thing I noticed in this, um, and this is actually, I was kind of shocked that I noticed it. Throughout this episode, we see circumstances where Jesus was paying someone's debt or shoring up their weakness undeservedly over and over again. So we have Peter, right? Peter was telling his wife, he's like, you're not going to believe this, but we got two boatfuls, and it actually is going to pay off all of our debt, right? So undeservedly, Jesus pulls off this miracle, which blesses um, Peter and gets him out of debt. Um, one thing else about Peter, too, is that Jesus actually helps Peter become his truest self, right? And that is so special because it's, it's, it's funny, man. We have, like, God knows who Peter is. Peter is this passionate, aggressive, assertive man. But you know that that can go either way, right? Like, people who deal drugs and are really aggressive and successful have the potential to be really good businessmen. They think really well about stuff. Like, it's impressive. If you've ever watched these, like, narco documentaries on Netflix about crazy drug dealing stuff in the States, it's like, wow, I might hire that guy. <laughs> but he's on a bad side. And so it's funny because we see, uh, I don't remember her name, e Eve? Eden. We see Eden and she's like, wow, the, he starts coming alive with this passion and he thinks he's blowing it. He's like, the security, I'm going to be gone. And she just loves it because this is the guy who she, he, she's seen the whole time. And that just really hit home to me because it's like, man, God knows who you are. He knows who your truest self is. And it's not like God's just trying to kill you and put Jesus there and everything about you is bad. Like, you're, a, you're special. God had something in mind when he created you. He had a personality. He had all these things. You were fashioned and formed in all these ways secretly in the womb. God knew what he was doing. And that needs to be redeemed, right? There's a redemptive act that takes place there. And we see that with Peter and his wife sees it. And I've had the privilege, man. You know, we no longer see any man after the flesh. But after the spirit, after what God is saying is true about them, we judge no man according to the flesh anymore, right? Paul says that. And, and so we see that obviously um, Eden's married to him and there's conflict, but she sees the spirit in him and she knows what that is and she recognizes when it comes out. And so just as we go throughout our day, I think uh, it's important to remember that aspect. Let's not judge based on flesh. Let's not judge based on weakness. Let's judge based on the spirit and what's truly in someone and treat them as if that is the truth because that's what it is. That's who God sees a person as. <clears throat> Another thing I noticed was how the disciples, I think it's Peter and Andrew. Is that his brother-in-law's name? One of those guys? Um, when they're walking and they're, they're both 
talking about how excited they are and they both have nervous excitement. They don't want to screw it up. Should we be early? Well, should we be on time? Should we bring food? Well, I don't know. I've never traveled before. People are going to think we're dumb. What, what does this look like? And it's like, man, that is so real. <laughs> When you're going after Jesus and you see these two, Peter's like, don't worry about it. We're just figuring this out. It's all going to be good. And Andrew's like, yeah, but they're going to think we're dumb and I want to make sure this looks good. I don't want to disappoint him. And it's so cool because that, that's such a human, such a natural human way to relate to things. And we see that everybody in here is doing things a little bit differently, right? Everybody's reacting a little bit differently. And it, it's just fun to see... Um, the human side of, of what was happening at the time, right? Like Jesus was a respected individual there. People, especially when they saw him do miraculous stuff like that, they were like, oh my goodness, this guy's packing some heat. And so they related to him in, 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 in different ways and their own personalities and their own weaknesses kind of start showing. And it's really cool. You actually see Jesus starting to sculpt those in coming episodes. Like with Peter, obviously Peter is uh, a little aggressive and, and assertive and, but pumped and ready to go. Like we were talking about that aspect of his, his personality being in the redemptive process. And you see Jesus, he doesn't even always correct him on things. He's just like, oh yeah, okay, we'll see. And Peter's getting aggressive about stuff. And it, it's fun to see, man. It's really special that um, Jesus interacts with people where they're at. Jesus interacts with people based on what their understanding and their personality. You see how he treats his mom extra special, right? You see how he treats Peter differently than he treats James, than he treats John. He, he talks to Thomas differently, right? Thomas is this logical, he's the wine guy. He's this logical thinker, this counter. And he's like, if, if I got attitude like that, I'd be like, all right, dude, make your own wine. <laughs> you know, he's giving him stink attitude. And he's laughing at him and he's like, this is ridiculous. And Jesus is just like, I'm not judging you, man. Just like pay attention, right? So obviously, um, and this kind of, I'm always going to say this if I do these, we see how normal Jesus was. He wasn't regular, but he was normal, right? He goes to parties. He hugs his mom. He sits at a table and enjoys the wedding festivities. He dances. He knows all the songs. He's li like, he's taken on not only human humanity, but like culture and tradition and all of these things. And we know what's funny, interesting note, Jesus listened to his mom. You know, like, talk about, this is a God, man. This is God. She's like, Jesus. Jesus. He's like, it's not my time. He's like, please, just, just figure this out. He's like, hmm, okay. <laughs> like, that's, uh, talk about a God who's humble, hey? Like, I get it's his mom, but Jesus knew who he was. I don't know if Jesus, what kind of, Thinking he had, if like, I remember when I thought about you back before the creation of the world, and now you're telling me that I have to get to it and make wine? Like he, uh, whatever, but he's submitting. He's being humble. He, he's not rising himself above. And this whole issue around the wine was incredibly significant. And they did a really good job capturing it. Because we're just like, oh, water to wine, cool. But the, the cultural ramifications, you know, the, it's like the further you go east, the, the more intense shame culture gets. So you go all the way to like China and it's like Japan, Korea, very intense shame culture. You honor the family, you get the good job, you work real hard. If you bring shame upon your father because of blah, blah, it's just right. And so you go west, it eases a bit, but still obviously in the Jewish culture of that day, um, shame culture was intense. And if you blew it on your wedding day and you didn't have wine, they said it, they will be ashamed. This will ruin the business that was supposed to provide the wine. This will ruin the family. This will be an embarrassment. Like this is the staple on their marriage is this big fiasco where there was a shortfall of product, right? That's bad news. And so they did a really good job capturing that. So Jesus turning water into wine was significant. And I think the reason Jesus struggled with it, um, and this is in scripture too, he, he obviously puts up a bit of a fight. He's like, I don't, I don't know if this is time is I think because Jesus, you know, we see a hint of it with John. He's like, John says, if he's doing miracles in secret, they're bound to become public very soon. And so Jesus was obviously like keeping the covers on, hiding things. He didn't want to just be exposed. But you turn water into wine at a wedding, everybody's hearing about that. Everybody's, it's just going to be out there. 
And this, I, I honestly believe that was going to be like, he knows that he's crossing a line publicly. He's not sneaking around in the dark anymore. He's going to be out in the open. And that, I think, would be the start, and he would know this, the start of his journey to the cross. Which, <sighs> sorry. <clears throat> It's just crazy to think that he, uh, he lived this whole life and then he, he starts his ministry and he, he knows exactly where he's going. <laughs> and he's dealing with these individuals and he's putting up with jerks and he, people are hating on him and people don't believe him and he's, he's got to be embarrassed a bunch and people have these expectations of him and people who are with him don't even get it. And he's, he goes throughout this three-year journey in his ministry, going to Jerusalem, and he alone knows the reason why he's going there. And he did it anyways. You know, this wasn't like a 10-second, Jesus, jump in front of the gunman and, and stop the bullet for humanity. Like, he had time to think about this. He had time to process what it was going to look like being crucified, what it was going to look like being maligned and shredded and well, he read the scriptures he knew it was about him he knew what they meant he knew the time was coming and he did it anyways and just watching him in the film just doing his regular thing enjoying himself and I'd be telling everybody and feeling so bad for myself <laughs> you know and he's like still focusing on other people and still pouring life into his disciples who he knows aren't even going to get it until after and he's still investing time. It's like, oh man, that's too much for me. <laughs> I liked where they went with um, Jesus' wine miracle because it actually blessed a whole bunch of people. It wasn't just a cool party trick, right? The winemakers got their butts saved. The family got their butts saved. Like, all these individuals, like, the business, like, everything, that, that whole, all the shame. We see this picture of Jesus preventing shame. We see this picture of people and their weakness. And when they submitted to Jesus, their weakness actually became their strength. Yeah, they had good wine. It was really good. Didn't have enough. They submitted to Christ, and they got the best wine. Right? Peter with the, with the fish. Not catching much. But they got nets, they got a boat. He submits to Jesus. Jesus makes up the lack, right? That's grace, and it's undeserved. Undeserved favor and blessing. Like, none of these people deserve that. Jesus didn't sit down with Thomas. He didn't sit down with the family and be like, all right, let's see your rap sheet. You've been paying the tithe. See how much blessing you're going to get. I'll do one wine vat, but not two. You just haven't been a good enough tither, right? He undeservedly and unabashedly gives gifts to men <laughs> and to women and blesses them. Jesus took their weakness and made them stronger than they had even been before. Peter was a good fisherman, but he'd never caught two, <laughs> two boat poles in one day, one moment. The winemakers were good winemakers, but they hadn't made the best wine that, that the master of the ceremony had ever tasted, right? And so... People who didn't deserve grace and blessing got it anyways. The winemakers did not deserve to get bailed out. They screwed up. They made a big mistake. They counted wrong. Some other things happened. People showed up. Did, and, and he was a stinker and had an attitude to Jesus. Like, did not deserve grace. Did not deserve a bailout. Did not, like, never mind just cutting it even. Like, there, what did she say? There's more than we even needed. Like, that's cool, man. <laughs> that's Jesus showing up. And it's funny, too, because this talking, there's a, there's a thread of, like, pride and humility we see. And we obviously see the, 
the father-in-law is just like proud and rich, right? He's loaded. We see Nicodemus has some pride issues. Peter obviously has a couple things going on there. But we see this thread running through the episode of pride and humility and then grace and blessing occurring. And the grace and the blessing always occurs undeservedly, but it always happens to the people who are like at their wit's end. They're like, we're done. There's no way out of here. The debt's got to be paid, and we ain't got fish. I need help. The wine's gone, and (laughs) it's too late. We're not getting any more. I need help, right? So staying in that place of weakness, um, not not like you're beating yourself up. Don't hear me like that. Don't be like, this isn't worm theology where you're a pile of garbage, and you have to, oh my gosh, I can't do anything right. Nothing ever works for me. Like, that's not not Christ-like thinking, right? Uh, There's a good quote I heard. I'm going to mess it up, though. It has something to do with, like, true humanity is recognizing your reliance on God and maintaining that. Make sense? So it's, it's interesting, because if we go to Romans chapter 1, Paul's talking about how there's these people, and they, they refuse to acknowledge God as God. And when they stopped acknowledging and worshiping him as creator, they started worshiping creation. And when they stopped acknowledging him as source, him as provider, him as, as God their minds got twisted. And then he gives them over to a debased mind, which just leads to the craziness that we're in now, right? So there's a real place, man. And they they showed it in the video. I don't know if they meant to, but I I noticed it. Where uh, when people were in that place of reliance and they submitted to God, if you want to use that word, they they weren't proud. Grace came, and it not only got them out of the mess they were in, but it put them in a better spot. And heart transformation began. You see Thomas, he's standing there, trying to count. And he's looking at Jesus like, oh my goodness. Peter's like, trying to tell his wife what the heck happened. He's like, he can't, this doesn't make sense. But guess who starts following him? These guys, right? So when we encounter Jesus, we encounter Jesus from this place of understanding that we're kind of screwed without him and staying in that spot. And when we receive undeserved grace and strength to save us, there's heart transformation. Right? And that plays out. That's not just from the episode. That's obviously, that's the gospel. When we see him, we're transformed into the same image. From glory to glory, right? By the Spirit. And so, when we see God, we become like him. If we realize our reliance upon him. And then there's grace and there's sufficiency. And the grace not only gets them out of their circumstances, but it actually puts them in a higher spot. It puts them in a better spot than they were before. And so... In our circumstances and the stuff we're going through in life, man, there is grace. There's grace, grace, grace. And grace isn't just a a check to get you out of debt, right? It actually sets you up to do better than you were doing before. Grace gives you the ability, the desire, the passion to live a righteous life. It doesn't just settle the balance sheet, right? It's also the fuel for the engine. And it's undeserved. Like, you, don't, you didn't earn it. You just get it. But honestly, I think, like, the square, the square in the round peg hole, um, it, the Scripture says that God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Right? I don't think it's that God is um, holding back. I, he gave his son. He's poured out everything. Heaven went bankrupt, if you want to say that. Heaven, Jesus was the best thing heaven had. <laughs> right? And he gave it up. And so I honestly think if, if, if pride honestly is going to keep us from, it's going to make us offended, we're going to get crossed, and then our heart will turn into a round hole, and God needs a square one to receive, right? Scripture talks about the sexually immoral, the liars, the cheaters, the witchcraft, the sorcerers, all these people won't inherit the kingdom of God. It's God like, it's mine. No. Can't have it. Scripture says it's his desire and his pleasure to give you the kingdom. But if you're operating in a mindset, in a heart that is doing those things, you're a round peg hole. It's not going to fit. 
The thinking and the understanding and the heart posture that's required to carry the kingdom of God does not work if you have the mind set and all that stuff that's still into sorcery. It won't, it doesn't work. They don't, they're like gears that are different sizes. It can't fit. That's why you must repent. You must change the way you think. What's it, metamorphosis or something? What's the word, Steph? You know, or Roger. Team Armbruster. Um, that, that change, there's a transformation that has to occur in our thinking. There's a transformation that ha- RJ would actually know. I saw him. Metamorpho. Right. So there's this actual transformation which is done by grace, which is undeservedly, right? And that actually enables us to carry that thing. If you want to say carry it, okay? I'm just using words to try and relate this sort of stuff. So, yeah, man, great episode. A couple choked up moments. Um, Like I said, I always got choked up just thinking about that Jesus was at this place in his journey he knew what was coming. He knew what this meant. And he decided to do it anyways. That makes every aspect of what he does just makes me emotional because it's like, oh my goodness, like he's going through the ringer. He knows it. And so uh, I was really blessed by it. But I think our, my takeaway for you guys this week, I guess, would be uh, humble yourselves. <laughs> That's not weak, piddly worm theology. It's not, I'm, I'm bad, I'm dirty, I'm stinky, nothing good about me. No, that's a lie, okay? If there was nothing good about you, Jesus would not have come to help, to redeem you, right? God doesn't pay good money for garbage. He, he spent the most expensive thing he had to get you back to establish you. You're good. But like that square and round peg hole thing, we, we need to start changing the way we think about things. Because if we actually want to walk in the fullness of God, we have to understand his love. <laughs> that's the rules. I think that's Ephesians 3 verse 18. If you want to understand and be filled with the fullness of God, you have to grasp the height, the width, the depth, the breadth of the love of Jesus for you. So that requires a change of mind. And it's a good thing, man. You think Mary is, like she's repented to a degree already. You think she's happy about that? Mary being, used to be Lilith. Did you guys know that Lilith is apparently like quite a demonic name. God, if your name's Lilith, I'm so sorry. I don't think anyone hears the name Lilith. Not the name Lilith, but there is this belief in, in Jewish understanding at the time. Lilith was like this dark woman spirit that was uh, against the children of God. Not just the children of God, but against humanity. And its name was Lilith. Kind of like Leviathan, Right? Same kind of theory, that snake spirit. Lilith was this evil woman spirit. And her name was Lilith. Significant. Interesting. And then Jesus calling her by her actual name. (laughs) I keep going back to that episode. Oh, that's probably my favorite moment in the whole series, though. Mary. (laughs) So, yeah, let's open it up to uh, some thoughts from you guys. There is an open mic. Up here, if you do not want to be on camera, then uh, Dan will run the mic to you, I imagine. Yep. Yeah, so thoughts, um, things you thought were cool, things you didn't like, blah, blah, blah. Let's hear it. Someone's got to break the ice. Dan will also be reading. I'll start you out with reading one from uh, online viewers uh, as you guys are warming up to come to the front. This was from Linda Arnold. She uh, pointed out what you had also talked about, Daniel, with the um, scene of, of Jesus changing the water into lo- to wine and said, Linda liked the part, this is Michael writing, Linda liked the part when Jesus dips his hand into the wine, the wine is dripping off his hands, symbolizing the road that Jesus was starting to journey on and the blood he would pour out on our behalf. Great observation. (laughs) That there was a lot of symbology in there. Like when, um, yeah, thanks, Linda, that was was insane. When when Jesus, or no, when um, Peter and his wife were treading out the grapes, 
right? And it's turning into wine. The wine is poured out, right? The wine at the meal. Like, there's so much sim- symbolic stuff going on there that it's, uh, it's pretty weighty if you start seeing it. It's on. <clears throat> Hear me? Okay. I have to say that that was my favorite part, too, was... Um, and I could see the emotion in Daniel's voice when he was talking about it. And just, like, when Jesus is like, I'm not ready. And then he's standing there and he's like, he's having that moment with God. And you just know that he knows that this is, like, the pivotal moment in history where if I take this step now, this starts the chain of events. And you could just see, feel, like, that emo- I just can feel it now, even that emotion of him being like, okay, am I ready for this? And he's like, yeah, okay, God, this is why I was born on earth and why I came is for this moment. And now, and like, here I am, so I'm ready. And, um, you know, it just brought to my mind the verse where it says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. And, you know, like, how you were talking about, he enjoyed life, he danced, he played with the kids, he you know, joked with Peter, he did all these things, and it's like, yet he knew this is where he was going, but he was so filled with the, with the joy. But anyway, that was the, the biggest moment for me, is when he just stood there in that moment, and he's like, it's like diving off the high diving board. If I take this step, it's all going to change. And yeah, that just really, really struck me. But I think there's so many other parts, too. Like, even watching, we were talking about the guys walking together. Like, how do we do this? Do we take food? Do we not take lunch? Do we? <laughs> um, and I think we could all feel the humanness of that, too. Like, when we're walking into something that's unknown, we don't know how to do it and how to go about it. And it's like, I don't know. Well, am I doing this right? Am I? And you, we have this fear of being foolish or looking foolish. Or, and yet there's that trust that's like, we just know that we're called to do this. And... Yeah, so you just dive in, right? So I thought that was a neat parallel between like Jesus standing there trying to make this decision and then these guys, each faced with their own decision, the same kind of decision, but it's a neat parallel. Yeah, that's an interesting observation too, that, that disciples were kind of weighing like, oh, what's this look like? Like, do we have to prepare more? I'm going to be traveling a lot. He's talking to his wife. Like, this is going to be... It's not going to, and I mean, I actually, I saw, like, looking at that and then knowing what, like, happened to Peter, it's like he didn't even know what he was talking about. It's like, I'm going to have to travel a lot. Like, yeah, it's going to be a lot worse than that. And it was. He was, uh, he was crucified upside down, as far as we understand, at the end. And the, counting the cost, right, like, seeing what this whole thing was going to, Jesus, obviously, that moment he's standing there weighing out, is this... Like, I'm pressing the red button here when I do this. It's going beep, and there's a countdown, and it's on. And so he had to face that as a man. And one of the best things, too, man, is Jesus understands. You know, we have so many moments where we see Jesus in his humanity in this series, where he's like, i got to make a decision here, and I have to submit to my mom, or I have to, right? I have to do all these things. And when we come to him, it's like, he knows we're weak. He knows the struggle. He understands. He understands what it's like to get rejected. He understands what it's like to fail. He understands what it's like for people to misunderstand. He understand, like he talked about falling and cracking his head open. That was funny. <laughs> Not in scripture, um, obviously, but um, could have happened, right? Yeah, thanks. Come on. Yeah, give him the mic. We want him on the for the recording. Come on, Henry. Come on. They want to know what you're saying back home. Are you going up? Okay. Um, oh, you. <laughs> um, this morning, I just, like, we've kind of been used to not coming to church for a long time because things are up in the air, so you kind of get used to staying home. And that's not all bad because you learn different things about yourself and about things, right? Um, so this morning I was reading in Hebrews, it says, uh, forget not the assembling of his hills together. And the purpose was to uh, spur each other on to love and good deeds. Yeah. And I go, oh, that's, and so Jesus went about doing good. So I was reading this little book on Paul Scanlon, writes this little book on um, Interrupt Me. 
And you know what? Jesus went about doing good. He wasn't about evangelizing at the wedding. It was about serving. He was the ultimate serving. He was serving. We make it, and historically, we made it about wine. A lot of churches we discuss, did Jesus make wine? Was it juice? Like, that's, that had nothing to do with the whole issue. There was a need for wine, and he served, he served and gave him wine because that was, that was that moment of love. To me, it was a, a real uh, touch of love that he saw, and he met the need, not from his perspective. It was from what was needed of the people, right? And, and, you know, this guy was saying that we had, like, we see things differently. We, we pick up different things from, from different, because of our own journey, right? And, and we were just, see, so we want to evangelize the world. And so two things that Christians hate is to evangelize and the world hates to be evangelized. The two things, but if you do somebody a good deed, it says, interrupt me. Um, like the good Samaritan, he says, interrupt me. And, and the church people were in a hundred yard dash and had room for, no room for interruption. But the man on a journey had time for interruption and changed the world. And he said, that's our neighbor. So leave time for interruption in your journey. Because it wants to do the good deed, you have room for evangelism. He says, let your deeds so shine before men that you praise the Father which is in heaven. So I have this book of, he writes all the little things, how he, he was interrupted, and how they praise God in heaven and say, angel, thank God for what he did for me. So they all praise God in heaven when they see a deed that's unnatural for, for us to do. He says, go about doing good, and you'll get a chance to evangelize just by going about in community and serving, be a servant. And be, that's to me what this whole wine thing was the beginning of, of the ultimate service, like the servant. And then he had, then you, you, have a, you have a pulpit at that point. You have an audience after that. Yeah. You know, he just talked a whole book full of how he, how we have many times judge a man by, or a woman by her bad hair or a man by smoking or drinking, not realizing if you go past all that and look at the heart of, the people there, you know. So it's just like it's a kind of transformation of go about and do good, and you'll have an audience. So that's just, I believe it's that. You know? Yeah. No, great observation. <clears throat> the, uh... <laughs> yeah, I mean, Jesus was obviously, he was trying to do things in secret up until then. And he didn't want to let things come across. But we see in Scripture, you know, and obviously that was Jesus, and he knew what was happening, and things were going to unfold because of the steps he was taking. He was going to the cross. But we do obviously see like what Henry was saying. There is, like, let your light shine before men. Um, that doesn't mean do it to be seen. But it means let the light that's there shine, right? The being seen is not the uh, prerequisite there. It's that you're already doing, so just let it, let it shine. Like, don't try to be a sneak about it. Um, yeah, the interesting stuff, too, about the wine and the, the stone jars, right? The, what does he say? Like, the stone is pure. It's filled with water, and then Jesus puts new wine into the pure jars, right? What are we? We're jars of clay. There's that, all that symbology about, okay, so we're going to be pure, clean vessels full of new wine. So Jesus is fulfilling all of this language that means a lot to him that we would probably lose it on. But that's why it's significant in the show when they, he says, Thomas, do you know why these are stone? Right? They can't be defiled. They're pure. And then Jesus puts new wine in those things. <laughs> it's pretty cool. Pretty cool. Yes, I'd just like to add the comment that I was reminded as I watched this Jewish wedding, how Jesus said, I think it's in Matthew 21, that the kingdom of heaven is like unto a wedding reception. So this is not just history. We're living in the kingdom, and, and this is what the kingdom is like. And, and, and you notice how they were having a, good, they were having a celebration, <clears throat> a kingdom culture <clears throat> in the midst of a, a culture that was oppressive. And, and, and the temptation for us as believers is to be conformed to this world and, and the oppression and, and just find fault at, at all the things that are wrong and the people in authority, like we're victims, you know. And, and yet God wants us to learn to celebrate in the midst of that and, and to know that we serve a king whose kingdom will prevail in the end. And, and I think there's a kind of a, a similar point made out if you probably all watched the movie Fiddler on the Roof. 
but how that even in that culture, in, in, in Russia, under the czars, how the Jews were under this oppression, but yet when they had a wedding reception, you know, it's that being renewed from the inside that enables us, I think, to endure. And so we need this type of culture in the church, you know, and you can't do that. You can't celebrate the way they did in a Jewish wedding if you just stay at home and, and, and think only of yourself, you know. You, we need community. We need relationship. And so I just, you know, I'm challenged in my own life. We, we want to see this restored. This is, this is normal kingdom living. You know? The kingdom of heaven is like unto a wedding reception. And, and that one song they were singing, is based, you can read it in Isaiah 33, 11 or 13, I think it was that, um, yeah, the voice of joy, the voice of gladness, the, the voice of the bridegroom, the voice of the bride. I mean, we're getting ready for the ultimate wedding reception at the marriage supper of the Lamb. We've got to start practicing this. We've got to start celebrating this way and release our sound, release our dance. And, and Jesus got accused, you know, the fact if you thought that's not what Jesus was like to join in the dance. And some of us say, well, that's not me. Well, well, um, they accused Jesus of, they said, John the Baptist, he, he's, uh, he's, he's come, you know, with a message that uh, was lamenting and weeping, and you didn't repent under him, but now Jesus comes and he, he's celebrating and he drinks with wine bibbers, and, 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 and he said, you have not danced, you have not celebrated. And so there's an invitation for us here, you know, to join in this kingdom celebration in the midst of a culture that's oppressive. So I thank God for every one of us, but we need each other and we need to do this together. Amen. Yeah, that's significant, man. Um, it would be awkward to go to Jesus' party and Jesus is the only one dancing, right? He's like, come on, guys. We're like, no. Standing there like Thomas. Um, I heard this one, um, I think his name is Sean Foigt. Is that how you pronounce it? He has this one song. He was doing it live. I think it was in Portland. And if you're f familiar with Portland lately, it's like 70-some days of consistent riots and burnings and craziness, man. And I don't know when they did this, um, this set, but he got up there and he's like, you know what, I think the church needs to start saying some things that are impossible and some things that sound really crazy. And they started singing, um, there will, there's going to be revival and they just keep singing that song over and over again. There's going to be a revival. In the midst of burning, in the midst of the worst political scene that Portland's ever been in, in the midst of the most violence that city's ever seen, in the midst of the police walking away, in the midst of all the crazy stuff, there's going to be revival. And, you know, that's because they're coming from a different perspective. And we're, it's so easy to get pulled into the world's perspective on things and be like, oh, my gosh, everything's going to crumble and crash. What am I going to do? Right? And just put that on and it's kind of fun because it's like, ooh, great, what's happening? But it's like, man, what's Jesus saying? Jesus is dancing at the party. Right? There's a perspective change that we need to have there. It doesn't mean we ignore what's actually happening, but what's heaven's answer? Yeah. Thank you, Roger. Boy, it's so, so hard to follow Roger. <laughs> um, but actually, when Daniel, when you were talking about um, the jars and the stone jars and how they were cannot be defiled. I only wonder with Thomas's mindset and I've had doubts in myself, I've had doubts from unbelievers put forth other possibilities. And so that just brought to light to me that perhaps he was telling Thomas this that these jars cannot be defiled, so therefore this is not trickery. Because in that situation, in that society, there was so much magicians and sorcery and things like that as well. And so he's telling Thomas, hey, you can't put sorcery in these jars, they're pure. Yeah. Yeah, you know, he definitely needed to meet uh, Thomas where he was at, right? It's like, this isn't, uh, he doesn't have, I don't even know what we could do. Maybe back then they had some stuff. I'm trying to think. It's funny, actually, because we, we have a crab apple tree, and we make our own wine out of it. And being a part of the process with the yeast 
and with uh, fermentation and the, it transforming the essence of what the juice is into this wine. It's very, watching this episode, I was like, huh. I would be shocked if Jesus just snapped his fingers and did that, obviously. But coming from the perspective of a guy who's like, I make wine for a living. I know what good wine is. I know what this should look like. And Jesus is like, dude, this ain't a trick. <laughs> like, it took like six people 20 minutes to fill these things up. He's not going to like, okay, dump them out. Go get some wine from the back of my truck. Bring it in here. <laughs> back of my cart. Whatever Jesus drove around. Yeah. One of the things that strikes me is those stone jars. Well, we are, as Christians, we consider ourselves to be clay, moldable by God. But there's this issue of, not issue, this reality of transformation that transforms me and you from being a clay jar that can be, uh, what's the word again? Defiled, that's the word. That can be defiled, we're going to be and are being transformed to stone jars when we are put when we are clothed in immortality, we will not be able to be defiled. That is a great hope. Amen. Thank you. Yeah, lots of significance behind that. I think the wine that the, the winemakers had was in clay. Um, so there was a definite message that Jesus was sending there. And he pointed out the uh, stone. Dan? This is from uh, Crystal online. She's referring to the blessing that they kept saying over the wine prior to, to yeah. drinking it. Um, said something, Lorinda pitched in here, blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, who brings forth fruit of the wine. And uh, Crystal was just commenting um, that it's the Lord that brings forth the fruit of the wine. And it was obviously pointing to Jesus. But she was also wondering if anyone knew if that, that blessing was based on a verse or scripture at all. I'm not sure if anyone can add to that, but uh, that's a question that's coming from online. Sounds like it's in there somewhere. Right? That works out. Sounds like something David might say. I don't know. Arm Brewster clan, RJ, these are our in-house theologians. It's from Jewish tradition. It's Jewish tradition? Awesome. Thank you, Brian. Yeah, they definitely didn't just stick to Scripture. They had their own sayings and songs that referenced. We see some of that in the New Testament, too. We see new songs coming out of people, and uh, pretty cool. Yeah, that's... Uh, it's, it's, similar, it's similar to when um, Mary... I think, yeah, Mary, previously Lilith, is quoting um, that Scripture at their Shabbat. And the guy she's talking about is right there, and she's like awkwardly reading this for the first time in how God knows how long. And then we have these people dancing around, singing, blessed are you, king of the universe, who brings forth fruit from the vine. And Jesus is sitting there, and guess what he goes and does? <laughs> brings forth fruit from the vine. He causes growth. He causes um, multiplication, right? Yeah, funny. Funny. Oh, that must have been. Imagine being one of those people and like, a few years later being like, that's the guy. Oh my gosh, that's the, that's the guy, <laughs> right? I saw him at this wedding. He had the, one of the first things he did, he turned it into wine. Oh, that, it makes it so real, thinking of things in terms like that, but yeah. Well, I think we're uh, about ready to start transitioning here. Um, I'm just going to pray before we transition and just thank God. Thank Jesus for who he is. Jesus, thank you so much for who you are and who we're beginning to see you clearer and clearer as the days, years, decades, and centuries roll on. Lord, I feel like we're, we're seeing you more and more collectively as a church worldwide. And so, Father, we just thank you for that revelation, the revelation of your son, who he is, who he is in us, Lord. And God, may we, may we just continually begin to understand and further grasp your love for us and the grace that you've poured out, and the example of humility that you demonstrated, Lord, as being one who's teachable and um, 
formable. And so we just thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much, Daniel, for leading us in our discussion this morning. And thank you for all of you who have contributed, not just this morning, but over these last weeks. It's been so rich to hear from the, the whole body and to see what happens when we, we all share the parts that are inside of us that come out. And, you know, sometimes we think we don't have much or we think, oh, that's silly or that's not, not true. Not true. God has made it so that we need one another and we need every part. And every time you act on that, I guarantee you, it's for a reason that's going to bless someone else and it's going to encourage the body. So, wonderful. Riley, run up here to this microphone. I want the people at home to be able to see you. Give us a hi. So good to have you back, Riley, with us again. <laughs> yeah, say, say a couple words of greeting to us. Uh, yeah, so... Hi, thanks for having me here today. Um, I got back last week on Monday, and so I'm going to be here for another two weeks. Um, yeah, for those of you who do not know who I am, who are watching, and, or maybe even here right now, uh, yeah, my name is Riley. I'm working with YWAM Turner Valley out in Alberta. Um, so for the, you kind of want, I bet you're wondering what I'm doing next. Uh, so starting in September, I'll be going to do the School of Biblical Studies like Daniel had done and uh, Stephanie Ambrister had done as well. Um, so I shall be doing that in September. Right now I'm just here for a bit of a break to get to visit with family because I haven't been back here since January now. So it's really good to get to come back here and get to visit with some people and get to catch up a bit. And then I shall be going back there and we'll be starting the School Biblical Studies in about five weeks or so. So yeah, that's basically what's happening with me right now. Um, yeah, thanks. Thank you, Riley. So good to see you again, have you with us. Um, Riley's been a real blessing to our congregation. It's our, our joy to partner with you. I, I'm guessing you and Daniel are probably heading back to Turner Valley around the same time then. Uh, week apart. Week apart. Okay, so you'll connect there again and keep spreading the love. Thank you for what you do. We're praying for you and uh, want to support you in all of that. Uh, a few announcements I want to share this morning, and then we're going to have a, a time of worship together. Um, Revival meetings coming up at the White Till Meadow. That's on Tuesday and Wednesday evening, August 18 and 19, coming up this week. Evangelist Matthew Morton and his wife will be there. If you don't know about Matthew Morton, I know Daniel did some uh, ministry with him. Um, when was that, Daniel? Like a year or two ago? Three years ago. And you can talk to Daniel. He's got uh, a friendship there, knows a lot about what's going on. I think uh, the Fresh IE, our, our local rapper, gospel rapper, will be there as well. So uh, check that out. There is pamphlets with information on the back table in the foyer. Rushing Wind Fishing Trip happened August, happening August 28th to September 2 or 4. There are 18 of us going up for that. There is still room to join us if anyone wants to jump in last minute. Thank you for your prayers. God miraculously uh, made a way for those camps to happen and, and go forward. So that's happening. Next two weeks, Michael will be leading... Uh, the discussion here on the, the episodes, and will also be facilitating. So, uh, and then Crystal is leading the week after that. So that's what we have to look forward to in the next few weeks. As we enter into worship now, I just want to pick up a little bit on what Daniel said about Sean Foyt and them singing revival over Portland. There's something more to our worship than just singing the words or saying words or encouraging ourselves, there's a change that happens in the atmosphere as we declare the truth of who God is and as we bring in our agreement with that. And I just want to encourage you as we, as we sing, as we agree together, there will be change. There will be transformation as a result. So let's join our voices with the worship team. Thank you. The floor is yours. Yes, indeed. Good to be here. Good to see all of you here. And uh, it's always a joy to sing to the Lord. So let's do that together. darkness. 
Till from heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets. To a virgin came the word from the throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt. the cross for even in your suffering you saw to the other side knowing this was our salvation Jesus for our sake you died I 
sing praises to your name praises to your name a name that's so much higher than all names all
know, as I was thinking about some of these characters that we've seen in a more personal way, I guess you could say, on screen, um, it's so powerful to recognize that once they encountered the Lord, something changed, right? And sometimes, you know, like, it's like they said, this is how I was, this is the way things were, and now this is the way things are. And the only difference is I've had an encounter with Jesus. And, um, I read something this last week, and I thought I would just share it with you, uh, something from Ravi Zacharias, and it kind of went like this. When God saves a person, what changes should we expect to see? What, what changes in a person? When God brings someone to salvation, the most remarkable thing we see is that God transforms the person's hungers. Sometimes gradually, but almost certainly, God doesn't merely change what the individual does, but what he or she wants to do. This is the work of the Holy Spirit in every believer. It's God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. So we see that he makes new people, right? He changes us, he makes us new, a new heart, a new spirit, new birth, new life, new mind, new name, new nature. Um, and that's all results in a new creation, which he talks about too in the word of God, right? That we are a new creation. Um, so we wanna make choices that help shape God's design that he has for us. So ask yourself, what are your hungers? What do you hunger for? I know my desire is to hunger more for the Lord and for his purpose in my life.
Jesus. We praise you.
cross as you wait for the crown. Tell the world of the treasure you found.
I'm just struck by, as we're worshiping now, proclaiming the name of Jesus, as we watched on the, the episode today and the, the episode for the last few weeks, that it's the place where people come to the end of themselves. When Peter, <laughs> there was no place left for him to go, could not pay his taxes, does not know how to do it. There was no place left to go for more wine. And then they encountered the name, they encountered the person of Jesus. And everything, everything changed in that one moment as they humbled themselves before him and they cried out for his help, for him to meet them. As they chose to say, yes, I will follow, I will trust. As they looked into his eyes and said, there's something more here. I choose to trust that. I choose to step out in faith. And I believe that you will meet me. And I just want to leave you with the words from Isaiah 30 this morning. We talked about humbling ourselves, God opposing the proud, but, but lifting up the humble. And wherever you might be, if you're like, like Peter, if you're like Mary, the other family, Lord, at, at, at the wedding, there's no place else to turn but to Jesus. You might be feeling that way right now with what's swirling around us. We don't know what church is going to be like. We don't maybe, some of us know if we're going to have a job, if there's going to be finances, other things. We don't know. But it says this, Isaiah 30. It says, the Lord longs to be gracious to you. And it says, he rises to show you compassion. It says, blessed are all those who wait for him. How gracious he will be when you cry to him for help. Although the Lord gives the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, your teachers will be hidden no more. With your own eyes you will see them. Whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way. This is the way. Walk in it. So let's cry out to him. Let's cry out to him. Let's believe in him. Let's take that step of faith to trust him and just watch what he is going to do. He is the same Jesus you saw in that episode. And he is the same this very day to you and everything you're facing in your life. He longs to grace, be gracious to you. He longs to meet with you. And he will rise with compassion to take you to that place. Amen. Love you guys. Bless you. Uh, Michael will be leading again the next two weeks. We don't know exactly what's going to happen in fall with Sunday school, with how we meet here with larger numbers, but, but be in prayer together. We have, have a God that does know, and he's going to guide us perfectly and wonderfully through it. And I believe he's going to do new things <laughs> that are far beyond our normal. And we want to go not back to the normal, but forward to his fullness. Amen? Amen. Bless you.